Hello and welcome to Oven Home and to this edition which concentrates principally on the continuing work of constructing from scratch a new engine shed for Weathertop. Uh, also a bit more work on the CVs and getting the trains to stop more prototypically uh, and the other bungalows have been completed and I can give you a bit of an idea of how uh, high oven will look with all the buildings. I think I've got all the buildings I need for that area now. But first off, let's uh, go back a few weeks now uh, and it'll explain why it's been so long in the making of this video. In the last video, I airily uh, said that I would uh, hope within a week or so to have been able to do the wall, wall panels and put them all together. Uh, I little understood just how much work was going to be involved for me in making the change that I mentioned or well hinted at in the last video which was to move over to using the two millimeter brick Slater's card, um, which do, did, just does look so much better. Uh, what you see in front of you is the totality of my work over the last uh, three or four weeks. Uh, not all my time has been able to be spent on the railway. I've been doing other things connected with the Bennis and Keneal Railway, which I'm pleased to say last Sunday and Saturday started taking paying passengers again for the first time in some 14, 15 months. Uh, but uh, work has progressed to the point where I can talk about it. There's quite a lot to talk about and I'm not going to do this in one lump. Uh, I will break this up. I will uh, move to dealing with specific things and, and spread it out through the video. Uh, but we are getting to the point where I can think about constructing one of the walls. And there are some changes that I picked up uh, partly in response to um, comments made on the last video. So I'm just going to move things around a bit and then I'll come and de deal in the first section with taking a look at the work that's been done to create the two sides of each wall panel. At the end of the last video uh, I asked the question to which I think most of you had picked up that I already knew the answer which was about um, the... let me just get this into focus, thank you. Uh, what sort of brick card should I use? And I went over to using the two millimeter. And that meant that each one of these had to be recut. I'd already cut uh, 14 um, for the 14 panels, seven on each side, that I was in, at that time intending to use for the side of the wall. Uh, I'll come on to some design changes, which may mean that I don't use seven. Um, I discovered that actually cutting, if I bring this in, these are, require quite a bit of individual cutting and that's part of the reason why I've been taking so long uh, in getting them all done. Uh, because first of all I had to go through and, and do the ones for this side which completely go around the surround of the window which is raised. If I move that to there you see that's raised. Uh, these were made as some of you will remember using a jig to um, Come on, boy, let's get into focus. Thank you. Um, and whilst they are very, very similar, um, they're not precisely the same. There are slight differences uh, on the frame. Um, it, as good as you can cut, you know, they're not all identically cut the same. And in gluing them together, things move very slightly, only very slightly. But it does mean that you can't just cut these out on a kind of production line knowing that all you need to count is sort of 20 bricks up and two and a half bricks in and away you go. So they all had to be bespoke cut uh, to fit round the frames of each of the 14 um, panels. That became actually even trickier when it came to the other side because the other side doesn't have anything really um, to go against. It's entirely flat. Uh, and that was done much more by getting an idea of how much of the window from the inside I wanted to see. If I put this window in, there we go, that clips in there. Uh, that's what you're now going to be able to see from the inside. Uh, and there was quite a bit of trial and error with several pieces of card going into the bin eventually uh, in how high or low uh, and how much of the window was on display. Uh, and how wide they needed to be. Uh, and then again, for each window, these had to be individually cut. And 
if I take the block as a whole, they've all been done now, um, you'll see that there is broad similarity, but it's not entirely uniform. Um, the, I think you can just about see that some of those are, are stepping out. So uh, that has taken a lot of time. Um, I found I couldn't do more than two or three without having to need to take a break. Um, I've got through goodness knows how many blades. <laughs> this plastic will take the tip off of a scalpel blade faster than you can say boo. Um, but it's all been done now. Uh, I've painted them as you can see. If you want to get an idea, this is the colour of the. Actually, let's get that on the piece. This is the colour of the uh, red brick you'll remember, which is very orangey, very very bright. And I was looking for a colour to use for the brick. Uh, and tucked away in my drawer was a paint of a uh, humbrol acrylic, a pot of humbrol acrylic paint, RC402, which is <clears throat> one of their rail colours as for rust. But I don't know about you, I'd rather like that colour uh, for the brickwork. It is going to get a wash over the top um, to help identify the individual courses. So that's come out pretty well. That's had two coats of the rust colour, and I've let it really dry. I did do some experiments uh, using a very light wash of, um, what was that, Tan Earth, the, uh, this one. But, uh, oh no it wasn't, I tell a fib, it was Sand Yellow that I used for the top one. That's too white to me, uh, I mean I could wipe more of it off but it was just too light. I don't know if you can see, yes you can. Um, in uh, about here, that is the tan earth colour, which again is a Vallejo model colour. Um, and it's very subtle, but it does just give the kind of effect I want. So all of these have yet to have the tan earth wash put over the top of them, um, which will then, that will give them, that, that'll have them completely painted. For the a uh, grey brick, which normally looks like this, which is really, again, quite light. I mentioned in the last video that I was looking for an off-white colour, um, and it's amazing how sort of inspiration strikes you. Uh, and I did do some experiments with a light grey uh, and then an, an over-coloured wash. Uh, and then for some reason I thought, go to completely to the other extreme. So I got some burnt umber. Uh, and painted over with burnt umber and then washed it off. And that's given me this eventual effect. And I didn't wipe it all off. I, I left it a, sort of a um, splodgy in places, if you like. And I'm really happy with this because this gives me the idea of an internal wall that was once much lighter, but over the years has got rather grimy. Uh, and if I do because you know, these were done individually, they're not all identical. And the combined effect when you put several of them together is of a, a non-uniform internal wall. And given that you've got um, uh, engines going in there, I don't think the engines would go in in steam, but it will still be a mucky, grimy place. Uh, that, I think, is a rather good. So that forms the internal of the wall. Now, each one of these uh, has a number on the back so that I know that it goes to um, panel number one, which is numbered at its top. Uh, and if we put this together, I hope we will have a completed panel. So let's try again. That goes on there. That pops into position here. That sits over the top there. And I have one of my wall panels, which will form the side wall. Uh, you'll see that I've already primed the um, window and the window is two of the brass windows attached back to back uh, and you may notice there is nothing yet in there but I'll come on to that as a separate thing about how I'm going to glaze those windows. Uh, that is giving me the, the, the panel. I've got them all done now. Um, this has gone on long enough. I'll take a break here and we'll go off and do something else. And then I'll come back on to some design changes 
um, inspired really by some of the comments that I that I had back and also how I'm going to glaze these windows because I think I am not far off being able to build the, the external side walls rather of the of the engine shed. In between cutting out the apertures for the windows to fit for the uh, engine shed uh, I completed the other three of the Nightwing kits which you saw me in the last video um, make one of. Um, it was actually a, a bit of a production line and I found uh, it a fairly straightforward job to do three of them together. It took me mm, about four or five hours perhaps, maybe a bit longer allowing for drying time between coats of paint and the, and the like. But all five of them are on here now. I think I'm comfortable with the number. I think any more might make it look like a housing estate, which is not the look I'm going for. I'm not sure whether that's the final position. I want to play with them a bit. When I first uh, laid out this top section, I did draw it where I wanted things to go uh, before I even made the pub. So uh, I know what I had in my mind then. I just can't quite find the piece of paper, but it's a, it is around here somewhere and I need to just dig that out to see how I intended things to go. And as I've said, I want this area to be raised up slightly um, so that it's not all too flat. Uh, and there's the, around here somewhere is going to be where I'm going to put a remnants of a castle. That the line when it was drawn in just went straight through what would have been a, a mound or an area that was originally part of the castle walls. And all that's going to be visible is a few stumps of the old castle walls. Most of it's been robbed out or fallen uh, into disuse or is now under the railway. That's the idea, if you see what I mean. Except that the railway just drove straight through it and dug anything out that it didn't really need, which uh, is fairly prototypical. But this is, gives you the idea of what the, what the area will be. Uh, the road is still showing here that will swing round to eventually to peter out here somewhere as a kind of, well it will be a road but not very not intended for sort of heavy traffic uh, around, around the front here you can just see and around the sides I'm going to be taking the cliff face down uh, which I always intended from the, the first design it was always going to be a fairly sheer cliff face coming down um, and then uh, this area is all going to be wooded uh, well wooded trees uh, and the lane will come round here uh, with grass really in the, in, in the back. Uh, so this will be quite a green area up here apart from obviously where the railway itself is because apart from the area by the, um, by the main church uh, there isn't a lot of green here. Not yet anyway and I know I've, I've got lots of uh, um, scenic work still to do so I might try and in, in put a bit more in. But it is a pretty urban scene, so you wouldn't expect too much in the greenery. But I think a few trees might go not go amiss on other parts of the railway. Certainly some trees up here, uh, and maybe even scrubland uh, between where the railway is and where the houses or the gardens at the back of the houses start. So, uh, but a bit more worn down and uh, rural is this top section is what it's going to eventually look like. So that's uh, the, the work on the Nightwing cottages completed, or the bungalows completed, uh, and it's time to get back to yet more of the engine shed. So here you can see one of the completed uh, panels put together as it was originally intended to be. Uh, so that's with the two H beams on the uh, out, or H columns on the outside. Uh, if you look to the side, you'll see that at the front it goes up right to the top. There's a gap there because coming through here is one of the side walls of the uh, canopy. They, that slots into there. Um, one of the, a number of people asked and raised the question about the height of the window from the floor. Uh, and that sits actually at about 18 inches, which I think is a legitimate point about it being a bit low. Um, suggested possibly four to five foot might be a normal uh, distance um, which by that time I'd made all the panels so I wasn't going to go back and recut all 14 panels 
Uh, I also realized when I used the template, which is um, all I have at the moment by way of a plan is this paper template, that when I put seven of these, there was originally going to be seven of these either side along this template, it actually doesn't leave very much room at either end for the rear wall or for the entrance. So I've decided to bring it down to six and that will probably finish about here and I can use this area to put some workshops or an office or two. There wouldn't be many offices here, but there would certainly be workshops where things like lathes and the rest might be, which would be away from the main body of the shed. Uh, and that gives me six of these on each side to create the wall. Um, but it is right that those windows look a bit low. Uh, I think you and Chalmers, um, Blackwood, uh, the Growler, um, was suggesting maybe putting it up on a plinth um, to suggest a concrete base on which these windows were sitting. Uh, and that combined with the suggestion about actually the windows are too low, which the more I looked at it, the more I realised, yes, they are too low, made me think that actually maybe we could put it on a plinth. Rather handily, um, I have uh, quite a bit of this stuff knocking around, <coughs> which is 4.8 millimetre square strip styrene. And it's, it's very slightly wider than the width of the, of the wall, but only very slightly, which means there's a nice ledge on the inside. Um, and if you put this on top of that, you now have uh, the equivalent of about four foot, I think, if I've got my maths right. Um, so that gives you a much better distance to the bottom of the window. It'll make the building a bit taller overall but nothing too uh, spectacular. The only problem was that then these uh, would sit on top of the plinth which would look a bit odd. Uh, so inspiration struck once again and instead I'm going to turn the uh, H-beams upside down so that the bit that I'd cut out comes down the front if I can Hold that there, you'll get an idea. That will come down the front. Uh, that actually means that the bar will still go through the middle, which is the, the side of the canopy. And I will add another strip of um, brick across the top to, put, to form a kind of uh, raised brick area uh, as a kind of uh, architectural detail which will cover all the gaps in between. The inside of the walls, once I've got the wall built, I will be cutting slits for the cross members to go down on the, on the inside. But this will largely hide the uh, canopy uh, side beam as it traverses along the wall on, on each side. So I've got to make up my mind what color I paint this, um, this stuff. Uh, I have now cut the first side, which is there. Um, I think a concrete colour, but a fairly dirty concrete colour. So I shall have a little look around what's knocking about. I've got a nice range of colours from um, the Vallejo. Um, I think I mentioned in the last video, I think in the last video, that I'd bought a set that was equestrian colours, which has got lots of really good um, well, browns obviously, but the kinds of colours you might get uh, with horses and people riding on horses. I also bought there, well, it said steam, but it's actually steam navigation, so steam ships, which gives you lots of lovely greens and uh, yellows and blues. If you'll just hold on a moment, I will swing you around to show you the array of colours that I now have. Um, the This, by the way, is I bought from Amazon. It's made by Vallejo, holds about 52 bottles of colour, I think. Uh, cost me about 15 quid. So Amazon were doing it at a damn good price if you fancy getting one. I just love the Vallejo colours. I've really gone over to them in a big way. Uh, and those two sets together, which is the cheapest way to buy them, um, I can't remember what they cost me, about 50 quid. Ooh, maybe a bit more. Um, but they've given me a really nice range of the kinds of colours I'm going to need for uh, building buildings and things. There's not much there that I can't press into use, as, you, as I discovered <laughs> um, with the tan, which is obviously a colour for, for leather and horses. 
um, but which I think will work very well as the brick course. So uh, I've got to paint this up. Uh, I'm, what I will next do is to form, is to create the three walls because this side is open obviously so the trains can get in uh, and get that square uh, and then I can start I'll construct the walls and put them on either side so that we've got that part done at the back here uh, as I've said I will I will probably brick that off so that trains can't go right up to the end and that will be workshop areas uh, at, at that end because you wouldn't get more than one or two engines uh, in here at a time uh, and I may not be keeping all my locomotives on the layout all the time anyway now that I've got decent storage boxes. So the last thing I want to talk about, which I'll come back to in just a moment, is how I'm going to glaze the windows. You may have seen in the earlier videos that the the frames were built uh, to enable two of these windows to go in with a piece, piece of clear plastic uh, in between them and that actually is exactly brings it exactly level with the depth of the window uh, and that was how I was intending to glaze the windows until I saw this month's edition of um, British Railway Modelling and Phil Parker I think used glue, uh, glue and glaze. Now I've used glue and glaze in the past to try and glaze windows and, and it was a disaster, an absolute and utter disaster. But I was intrigued at the method that he used on an, a double O scale uh, kit to glaze the windows and the effect that he got. So I decided to give it another go. Um, now, without stealing his thunder, uh, he shows you his own technique, which is using a, um, a screwdriver to drag the glue and glaze over the apertures so that it forms a film and then dries clear. Uh, so I got, bef oh, this is an, an older set, which I hadn't painted up. Uh, that's what I did. Uh, and the effect, I have to say, is quite stunning. This is the glazing using the glue and glaze which, especially for an engine shed, looks to me to be exactly right. Um, you're not going to want to be able to see through it as if it was a, the front window of a house. Uh, and this was done um, using a screwdriver, which I'd kept here and I've now lost, it doesn't really matter, a very small screwdriver, dipped in the glue and then dragged down the back of this. So the, the glue is on the back here. It then forms into the holes and over the space of about an hour it dries clear. Um, I think that looks much better than a piece of perspex. Um, when you pop it in, I don't think this is the right one. <laughs> um, so once that's in position, the effect of that it seems to me is really most impressive and I'm, I'm really pleased with that outcome. So what I've done so far uh, is this is actually is, it, is that the one or the two? Oh uh, yes, I've I've had two sets of these, and all of these have now been glued together, and were then primed. Let's just get back into focus, and were then primed uh, as one piece. This time round, uh, I did take advice because I've mentioned in the past I've always had problem priming things. Gave them a really good clean to get all the grease and muck off, 
and lo, the primer has gone on really well. Although I'm using a new primer, which is um, intended for uh, war gamers to paint up their things. Uh, it's gone on really well. I've not had any problems with it dropping off, but I think the combination of things has, has made it uh, work well. So they're already done. What I will now be doing uh, is gluing, putting the glue and glaze on them all. I've got, as I say, to do the wash over here to get the um, brick course uh, shown up and then we can start actually constructing the engine shed. That's an awful lot about the engine shed, but I think we are, um, it's quite painstaking work and it's taking me a long time. But I can now see the two side walls. I've got a good idea what's going to be down one end. And I think I have an idea how I will marry that. The front is going to be really quite open. Uh, and that I think should be more straightforward. And then I'll turn my mind to how I'm going to roof the canopies, which I haven't yet finally decided. You'll not be surprised to hear. But that should be a journey of discovery for us all. So uh, with that, let's go back. And now we will take a look at um, my continuing adventures with CVs uh, and my ability now to stop the train wherever I want to do. You may recall in the last video that I was playing around with CV values uh, and I think I mentioned in the last video that uh, Mark Island had already given me the information um, to be able to set the decoders up or if he hadn't he has now um, to use the active break function on the decoder that I'm using. And the decoders that I'm using are uh, these, a Zimo MX617N. Um, the newer Zimos you can set up so that you use F2 as your function key uh, to use as a brake. So that as you've taken the power off, the train is slowly decelerating and using the function, the F2 key, you can brake it to stop precisely where you want. Uh, he also suggested some other changes for acceleration and deceleration and I'm really pleased with uh, the effect of all of these and I'm going to give you a little bit of a demonstration here um, which I'm hoping that you can see well enough um, when we get over to the station but we'll have a look. What I'm going to do, I'm only going to do it with the Duchess of Norfolk uh, but it works equally well on both. Um, as the Duchess of Norfolk comes along here, it's travelling at a scale speed of 72 miles an hour as it hits the tunnel, or well, goes into the tunnel. Uh, I've cut the power now, so there's no power uh, on the controller. And you'll see the locomotive is decelerating as it brings its train into the station. I'll keep it about here because you can watch the rear of the train until I see it just appearing the other side. And I put the brakes on and we are perfectly stopped in the right place. Uh, it works really well. I'm really pleased with it. Um, that decoder that you see is probably going to go into, I'm hoping, that I'll get the uh, long-awaited Sonic um, tank locomotive that's been coming an awful long time. It's supposed to be almost here. Uh, and then I will also swap out one of my older decoders uh, in one of the other steamers and eventually I will want to try and get all my locomotives with the active brake function because it makes driving them much more fun um, whilst that's going round. The Pullman is harder to show you because I need to look underneath the baseboard. When it gets halfway round underneath the baseboard, it's travelling at a scale speed of 87 miles an hour. I cut the power on it now and you'll watch it come round and you'll see it decelerating into the platform. It's doing this under its own sort of um, control, if you like, that the decoder is making it slowly decelerate. And I will use the F2 key as it comes out the end there to stop it at the end of the platform. Um, it really does, I have to say, add to the fun of driving the trains. Um, so that's, uh, that brings this edition to an end. I hope you've enjoyed the, the uh, video. Uh, a lot about the engine shed but I promised that there would be and actually I've been doing quite a lot. I can now actually see what it's going to look like and I think it's going to look fine. Um, you can never tell as you're building something but I think it's going to look fine uh, and there's still lots and lots to do 
um, before we get to, to the end of that particular road. If you've liked the video, well, please do give it a thumbs up. That always helps. And if you haven't subscribed, well, think about subscribing. It'd be great to have you along and hit the bell notification to let you know when I'm uploading. And of course, please do let me have your comments. As you will see in this video, the design of the engine shed has changed fundamentally because of the useful comments that I've had uh, in response to the last video that I put out. Uh, and I can't tell you how much it really helps and just makes me think harder about the things that I'm trying to do. And it is a real help to have people prepared to give their time to give me comments. So until I speak to you again in about a fortnight's time, that's bye-bye from me. Bye-bye.